realwatersports.com right in the midst of under the glass series with Brett Barley. Yeah. I just saw they did one. I think Chris Christensen posted it of the lane splitter by Chris Christensen surfboards and Brett Barley. That guy is a hell of a good surfer. I gotta say such a good surfer, such a nice kid. Look, I'm going to zoom up a little bit. There's a lane splitter right there in your midst. Wow. That looks unreal. Yeah, exactly. Unrealwatersports.com. Realwatersports.com. <laughs> um, so obviously they have 1,500 surfboards in their inventory, but then they these review videos are becoming all the rage. On uh, I think they're partnered with Surfline actually on these. So you can find them on Surfline's website or just go on YouTube or realwatersports.com even, and they're reviewing the surfboards that are on the rack. So they're based in North Carolina. They'll ship you a surfboard anywhere in the world. But if you um, want to you know, learn more about it, basically, these videos are a great way. I think it's an 18-minute video, so it's really thorough, and Brett puts it through, puts it through the paces in a lot of different conditions and then has re real detailed uh, discussion with the trip about the board. So check out realwatersports.com for all your needs. And then Waterways Travel has done a thorough job sending you and I to El Salvador. We are leaving this weekend. Yeah, look, waterways travel, the, the thing about, and I, I believe this with all of my sort of my travel is that you need experts, right? Whether it's like, like I use a, an expert rental car service, which I won't mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. I, I use expert travel insurance services, which I, I won't name. And I will name waterways travel because we, you and I use expert surf travel services and waterways are the experts those guys know exactly what's going on there's no one more expert and the, i just can speak from my experience uh booking this el salvador trip they've made my life so easy so we organized 20 listeners 18 listeners to come and join us and um i did very very little work i'm the point person on the project but i did very little work other than receiving an email and directing it. And Waterways has been so thorough in sending me spreadsheets, uh, itineraries, lists of what to pack, references for travel insurance recommendations, all of it every step of the way, super attentive, incredibly detailed. And now we're just mere days away. So I can't thank them enough. And yeah, for any of your surf travel needs, they are kind of a one-stop surf travel concierge for the entire globe. They've been doing it for 30 years now, since 1994. So they are the experts in the space, waterways. As we see some movement at the takeoff zone, it's Kelly Slater grabbing rail. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy, David. Oh, my. It's April. Uh, it is April 4th, David, a special day. And, um, man, it's. Uh, welcome to the show. It's spit. I guess I should say it's spit. It is spit. We're talking spit. I'm literally spitting on my microphone right now. And um, good morning to you, dear citizen. Good morning to you. Um, is it a special day? More special than any other day? Is this a it, date of it note? Is, it is. This is a. Uh, this is the anniversary of my wedded bliss. No way. <laughs> yeah, way. Uh, 25 years or so, 26 years. Holy guacamole, dude. What are you doing to celebrate? We're going on a hike. That's an <laughs> awesome way to celebrate. Um, gone are the days of overindulgence and getting sloppy. <laughs> Just do something fun that makes you feel good. Yeah. yeah good for did. you. Yeah. Good for you. Um, where'd you get that shirt? AARP surf team with the ACDC kind of font and logo. <laughs> My very good friend, JP at the board source, JP St. Pierre, who's probably the most clever and has the most fun on the interweb. That is very funny. Yeah. He's a good um, guy. Have you reached AARP age yet? Oh yeah. You have? Yeah. I don't know. What's the next level? I'm the next level up. Oh, really? Okay. Which might be um, like, you know, Medicare, Social Security. <laughs> They've AARP started sending me mailers. Dude, it's easy. I think you only have to be 50 
to be in yeah. the double ARP. I'm uh, I'm eight months off, or I'm sorry, eight years off, not eight months off, eight years wow. off. So I got a ways to go. Um, yeah. what, I think we could do a PSA right here, though. Uh, you mentioned we're going, obviously, we're going to El Salvador this weekend. You mentioned travel insurance. Do you actually get travel ins- insurance? I absolutely do. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think the move, I think for travelers, especially as you get older is to get, buy as much travel insurance as you can possibly afford. Okay. Like don't skimp on traveler's insurance because it's one of those things that when you really do need it, you'll be glad you, you paid the 200 bucks, you know what I mean? Or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like don't, yeah. don't skimp out, like get the most. I've heard horror stories of people who didn't have it, you know, and have some medical emergency and they need to be hella Um, I've, I don't, I don't remember ever buying it in the past, but for this trip I did, I looked it up yesterday. In fact, I booked it and it was only a hundred dollars. Yeah. And I was like, I, for some reason in my head, I just figured it would be more expensive. Obviously it's based on, um, how expensive the trip itself is. So the trip, more expensive trip, they're going to require more to insure you. But for this trip, for us, for El Salvador, it's a hundred bucks and it just gives you peace of mind. It like covers, you know, a hundred thousand dollars of medical care if you were to need it. Obviously canceled flights or anything like that, it also covers, but for a hundred bucks, it's cheap. I feel for the peace of mind. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, my, my feeling is the most important thing is get me out of this country and get me into the United States where I have health insurance and my, you know what I mean? So like, it's that flight, that emergency flight yeah. to USA healthcare. Yeah. Well, we've talked about horror stories. There was Emio Cermak um, from Tahiti who came and served in the pipe, one of the pipe events this year and got injured and then was laid up in Oahu with mounting medical bills without insurance And so I think that's when it most recently came up. Um, But yeah, that's our PSA. If you can afford it, go for it. Seems to be a prudent thing to do at this point. Yeah, for sure. Um, I got another follow-up, a phone call, and then a follow-up email if you want to get into it before we uh, get into the bulk of surf news. Sure. Okay, let me find it. People cannot believe that you are secretly a poet and an author, Scott. Oh, no. Hey, guys, listening to the spit on the 28th, right here at the beginning, you're talking about the books that Scott Bass has apparently forgotten that he's written. To me, it seems uh, really kind of crazy. How do you forget that you've actually written a book? I, I just don't understand that. Oh, there's a book on kayaking. Oh, that's right. That's right. I think that you asked me to write that too. Um, what else is out there? I got to Google Scott Bass now when I get to a computer because I got to see what else is out there. A book on underwater basket weaving. A book on how to pick up chicks. Oh, man. The possibilities are endless with Scott Bass. Anyways, love the show. Keep up the good work, guys. Keep them guessing, Scott. Well, I mean, many people know that I was involved in a documentary film. That's probably one thing that's out there. And you can get that. You could rent that documentary film on Ira Opper's, um, I think it's called The Surf Network. It is. Where you can rent stuff. So there's a film called Between the Lines, which is a documentary that I did with two friends of mine. And um, it's a look at surfers during the Vietnam War. So that's the only other thing I think that's out there from, uh, you know, editorial content standpoint. Your resume is vast. The thing about those books, like I mentioned last time, they just basically sent me a template and said, fill it out. It wasn't like I wrote anything. I just, it was was like, you know. Plug and play. And by the way, you're glad I didn't write it. (laughs) The template probably did me justice, you know. Um, I mean, ask Lewis Samuels. I'm not the greatest writer in the world. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I'm really good at cover blurbs. That's sort of my expertise. Like I can write a really good cover blurb. You came up with the name Spit for our show. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Yeah, um, that's what I mean. That's kind of a cover blurb. That's exactly right. Yeah. So um, uh, that Surf Network, the most easiest, the easiest way to access that is they have it on Amazon. So you can go on Amazon Prime and just link into the, they have different channels and the Surf Network is one of the channels. Uh-huh. And Ira Opper has done a phenomenal job archiving 
he's attempting to archive all surf films, v DVDs, VHS, whatever videos, um, and put them all there digitally. So you can find a ton of stuff, deep cut stuff that maybe you grew up with and have nostalgia for. So go to the surf network on Amazon. Um, but as it relates to your Nat Geo experience, I actually got an email from a guy. He said, good day, DLS and Mr. Bass. Longtime listener, I write you as steam bellows from my ears regarding your recent praise of Nat Geo. Firstly, a disclaimer, I work in the Pacific Northwest in the marine biology field. However, I will not identify myself as an expert. And I write this in haste as I should be returning to that work. That said, I could not listen to your most recent show without responding with some actual facts <laughs> you were correct nat geo used to be a great publication while i agree right. uh and from purely a business perspective they are doing phenomenal with their digital social film etc however and this is a significant however when nat geo was sold to disney they lost all credibility in the scientific community their focus shifted significantly and they began producing reality TV shows and other clickbaity fast media garbage. Contrary to your claim, David, that the regarding the best writers, I do not believe that Nat Geo employs any staff writers anymore. I'll give you one example of this terrible misinformation they have recently produced and fed to the masses. Uh, some months ago, I saw a video that Nat Geo Wild had produced and released some moon jellies congregating in swarms to feast on salmon eggs. He goes through and gives this long, detailed explanation of the video and why it's inaccurate, basically saying it was filmed, wasn't filmed in the wild. But um, I'll kind of skip through all of that and then just follow up with. Uh, you'll notice it's posted on a website which is intended to be a resource for teachers. Shocking. So this episode of Nat Geo that's purported to be fact and teach a teaching resource is in fact not shot in the wild and totally misleading and inaccurate because the moon jellies would never harvest, you know, feed on the salmon in real life. Anyways, he says, take it as you will. Do not believe everything that you see, read, or hear. Love the show. Regards, John. So I well, figured that was an important PSA to share as well. That is. And I'm glad he brought it up. And he's right. You know, um, things changed a lot. It went from sort of scientific academia to, uh, like he said, clickbaity, Disney look at me type stuff, which, you know, it, the content might be entertaining and good, but I think the distinction that he's making here is don't uh, take it as scientific fact, just because Nat Geo's branding is on it at this point, you can enjoy the TV show or whatever, but take it with a grain of salt, get your science elsewhere. I think a good rule of thumb is if it says Nat Geo instead of national geographic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you want to move away from it. Yeah. Or if it says, if it's owned by Disney, it is right. probably strictly for entertainment. Exactly. Well, um, okay, we've got some news. we got, there's a little bit of Kelly Slater news. There's a lot of WSL news. And, um, you know, there's also must moments. There's, yeah, I'd say let's cover some of the Bell stuff. I mean, there's important storylines emerging <laughs> in professional surfing coming through that event and going into the cut. Um, but yeah, where do we begin? I think that we believe, we begin with Gabe Medina, which I don't think we talked about last week, right? So It had not happened last week. It had not happened. We so Gabe Medina lost a heat to Cole Hausman. And he didn't surf well. He wasn't competitively savvy. Gabe was not. He gave up a wave. He had priority. He gave a wave to Cole Hausman, who absolutely destroyed the wave and got the score he needed. And um and round Gabe of, went on in it was a round of thirty round of thirty two. So early round heat. Um I've I've got Gabriel's clip if you want me to play it. Sure. Okay. You want to lead us into the clip? Um he's about to well, he does give his post heat interview and um it's sour grapes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let me see if I can find it. There it is. So one thing that's great, by the way, in that, so this clip, Gabriel Medina's post heated interview after his loss was posted by Survival League. So we owe a shout out to Survival League because I started, I wasn't watching this heat and I started getting direct messages from people like, hey, are you listening to Gabe right now? I'm like, shoot, where can I find it? And I'm scrambling. Survival League had this up within minutes somehow. So shout out to Taylor from Survival League for doing this. And he did say in the comments section as well, like, hey, 
kudos to the WSL for interviewing the loser, which is something that you've advocated for for years and they've done kind of intermittently. But this is what Gabriel Medina had to say in his post heat interview. Yeah, tough end to the heat there, Gabby, for you. I'm sure you're very disappointed. A big mistake there, letting that wave go under priority. Talk us through it. I did the mistake. <laughs> uh, this is funny. Uh, this is the worst judging me I've ever seen, but uh, it's bad for the sport, you know. Uh, I know we travel. I've been through a lot of judging things, but maybe I feel like this is the worst one. Uh, but it's something that we got to talk about. We pretend that it's not happening. It's it's happening, you know. It's it's bad for the sport, and uh, I just hopefully it can improve and get better. Uh, hopefully they listen more to us, you know. Uh, but yeah, it is what it is. It's it's happening. And your take on that is that the wave was far too small. Oh uh, yeah, those they gave me the best wave of the heat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and the the last wave was pretty small. I didn't even paddle. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm going to try to focus on my surfing, but this is sad. Uh, yeah, you know, like so much traveling, so much in the line, and we travel, we, we go far. Uh, our families are back home, uh, we, tra uh, we train a lot, and uh, yeah, I just feel bad, you know, it's, it sucks, but it is what it is. All right, we'll see you over in Margaret River. I'm sure you'll come back stronger. Wow. All right. Hmm. So sort of a, well, definitely a poor move in my opinion. Um, over the years, I had built up a real admiration for Gabe Medina. I used to despise him, as you know. I called him Gabby at the time. <laughs> you know, he was the young wonder kid. He won, I think he was 17 in, in massive, crumbly San Francisco Ocean Beach, which really put him on the map. And made me realize okay this guy is a force because you know you expected him to do really well you know in small little aerial type situations but in in sort of you know thumping ocean beach he he dominated and and gabby threatened my desire for usa dominance you know and and then he did more he destroyed usa dominance and then his buddies joined him this actually took some of the sting out of Gabe's elite status when the Brazilian storm took over and then he fell off tour. He fell in and out of love. He probably lost some money in a divorce and others took over who weren't frankly as good as Gabe and, and, or Gabby. And, and I started calling him Gabe or I started calling him Medina. And then I realized that Gabe was in a comeback story. You know, he was far and away the dominant competitor in my eyes. And he had the, he had the, the chops for Chopu, you know what I mean? He had the air game for Brazil and lowers. He could tame pipeline. He had it all, and he was going to prove it again, and I loved it, and I rooted for Gabe. And then this, you know, this is this is kind of like poor me. Judges suck. WSL sucks. It'd be one thing, I think, if he had a little bit of – um some proof in the pudding to kind of stand on his opinion with. But to me, Cole absolutely ripped the crap out of that wave. I think he deserved the score. It was in no way a, like a, a judging mishap. I think him making those comments surprised everybody. I think I, I was surprised that he like, it was completely surprising. I thought he was just going to say, yeah, you know what? I shouldn't have given that wave away under priority or whatever, but this was really just real baby kind of baby stuff. You know what I mean? And so he's back to Gabby, you know, the whining Gabby. And I was disappointed. I'd like to hear your take on it. Like I said, it, I felt, I feel like if he had something to stand behind, but if you watch the video, it's not like there's any proof here. Yeah. Uh, I want a poem next week from oh. Gabby to Gabe to back to Gabby or something like that, because I, I feel like, like you had all of the, certainly the passion for it to put this poem together, but you already have the words for it. You can just kind of <laughs> condense it down. Everything you said was almost poetic, just in a yeah, verbose you know, uh, delivery. So you can kind of yeah. concise, tighten it up. You've, you've given me a project. You've given me a, an assignment. We'll work on it in El Salvador. Okay. <laughs> we'll workshop it with the group. Oh, wow. Um, well, so like I said, I did not watch this heat live, 
I had turned the event on and the waves were small and it was just like, whatever, dude, I'll put it on the background and kind of go about my day. And I started getting those messages. So I listened to Gabriel's post heat, what we just listened to before I watched the heat back. And I was actually glad to see Gabe spouting off. I was like, this is how we all feel kind of throughout any given season, not, not every event, but you know, throughout any season, there's three to five situations where we're all just shaking our heads going, the viewing experience is clearly different than what the judges are assessing and feeling. And there's a real disconnect. And I, and then the, the surfers are usually so uh, bland and not speaking, you know, their opinion that we just feel disconnected as the viewer. So to have Gabe finally piping up, not finally, because he piped up last season after the, or maybe the season before, after the surf ranch event, he's kind of the guy who will say what he needs to say. And so I was glad to see him saying what he felt he needed to say. Good on Gabe. I still like Gabe at this point. Then I went back and watched the heat and I was like, Cole smashed it. Like Cole won that heat. And Gabe in that interview, he says, oh, that was the, it was a small wave. I didn't even look. And then they gave him the biggest score. When you watch it back, it's not the smallest wave of the heat, and it is deserving of the biggest score of the heat. And as you stated, Gabe actually had priority. This was a situation where Cole Hauschman needed a high six, and Gabriel Medina has priority. So he's sitting on the inside of Cole, figuring he'll burn Cole if Cole gets a wave. Cole got that wave. Gabe assessed it, didn't even lay onto his board to paddle. He assessed it and decided he wasn't going to go. And as he's looking down the line, like, I think that spot that Cole took off on looked mushy. And so Gabe was like, oh, this is a flat, mushy wave. Like, I'm not even going to take a look. Gabe made a mistake. That wave was not mushy. It was that one takeoff session that was mushy. He made a snap judgment. It was wrong. And before he even had time to look back and reassess, Cole had already blown the back out of the lip. This huge mountain of spray lands on Gabe. Gabe got sprayed like a complete... I mean, shower. that is the most, it was yeah, a shower. Yeah. it was a shower. That is the most insulting thing you can do in surfing is spray somebody. And it's the most humiliating thing that you can have done to you. So Gabe with priority makes the assessment and sitting on the shoulder acting like, oh no, you know, boom, gets showered. And I think that was the moment of shame that set off this later, you know, uh, tirade that he went mm. on. So before the shower even fully lands, Actually, as it's landing on him is when he kind of looks back to see what Cole's doing on the wave. Cole's already in his second turn, and it's the sickest turn of the heat. The turn is like loose. The fins break free. It's radical. And I'm looking at those two turns alone, and I'm going, boom, got the score. You need two solid turns back to back. He just nailed them. And he goes down the line and then finishes the wave, claims it. He got the score in my mind. It took some time until the judges delivered the decision. But in my mind, he nailed that score. Judges are not at fault in this scenario. So now we look at how Gabe responded. And Heath Josky actually left a really salient comment. Uh, he said, effing horrible sportsmanship. What a kook. How can he make that call without watching the footage back thoroughly? And after his emotional out outburst has passed, I wonder if he was grossly, if he was grossly overscored, would he still call out the judges? Absolutely no way unbelievable. So I think he Josky presents something per, really well is Gabe hasn't even watched back the footage. Gabe saw the wave from behind. So how could he possibly judge? And we all know your own surfing looks different on camera than what you think happens. So Gabe needs to go back and watch his two best waves, go back and watch Cole's two best waves before he makes such a big statement like this. And then as Heath also said, also let your emotions pass before you can make a rational decision. So this is all a result of kind of what you pointed out with your soliloquy, which is it's all about Gabe's personality and bravado in this moment, you know, and this is why we've had problems with Gabe in the past. Gabe does not uh, make an, a kind of objective assessment of this situation. I think Gabe has an ego. Gabe has kind of earned a, a certain amount of ego through all of his accomplishments and probably doesn't have enough people telling him no along the way to where he's got a God complex. He comes up from the beach and is just like, how could a rookie possibly ever beat me? I assessed that wave. That wave wasn't good enough. There's no way that wave even had the score on it. So 
the judges are wrong, Cole's wrong, everybody's <laughs> wrong. I'm coming up to tell everybody they're wrong because I know best and I would never make a mistake. Except it turns out you did. The tides had turned. Wow. Yeah, buddy. Bringing it. You know what? I got uh, two or three uh, titles for the poem. One is, could be the shower. The other one is the tides have turned. Wow. I like it. Pretty good insight there, David. And, um, and from Heath as well. And yeah, I mean, I really like the concept of this God complex because that's kind of what you get from him, right? Like there is no uh, humility there. And that's a little bit of a bummer, but the, let's well, not let this moment or go ahead. You had, some I was going to say, I was going to say it was a bad, it was a bad look for Gabe for the reasons that we said, but then I, after a day or two went by, I was like, clearly Gabe has like rewatched the footage and I'm sure he has kind of a different opinion about it now. No WSL posted an Instagram clip a day or two later of Cole winning and Gabriel like did laughing emojis in the caption, you know, basically saying this is all a hoax. You guys are joke. Like Cole didn't win. I should have won that heat. And I'm thinking, dude, how do you have zero humility now? How do you have zero objective kind of looking at it from another perspective to see you look like a fool right now? You're losing well, fans. I I have a uh I mean, how how does how does Ga how does Ga uh, Gabe? I'm gonna just call him Gabe because I don't really give a shit. I don't think Gabby was ever an insult, even though you might have been using it as an insult because everybody Maybe was not. calling him that way. But and I don't want to insult anyone. I, I don't really care that much, to be brutally honest. Um, but I will say this: how does how does Gabe Medina respond through the next you know number of events moving forward? And my gut is telling me that it's not going to go good for him that i think he might because he hasn't sort of went yeah you know what i looked at it you guys were right i maybe i overstepped you know like because he hasn't backpedaled or at least um i guess backpedal is not the right phrase but he hasn't sort of lived up to the moment i don't think it's good for him mentally i think mentally now he's still got this screw those guys WSL doesn't know what they're doing. I don't really care anymore. There's this, I don't care sort of tone around what he's saying and how he's saying it. And if you don't care, you will not do well. I agree with you. Um, I think I've stated in the past about Gabriel Medina years ago. I was like, you know who he was so dominant. I was like, you know, who will ultimately beat Gabriel Medina, Gabriel Medina. And I think we're in that moment again, where he came back with a new chapter, Gabe 2.0, after he went through something that was very humbling, you know, fully in vet, like certainly the relationship with his stepfather, who apparently is back on the scene. I saw him at Bell's. Um, and then, but that shook him up. He invested quickly into a relationship, got married, went through a divorce. And so coming off of that divorce and taking a little bit of time off the CT, he came back as a different person. You know, you could see a certain humbling there, but it's a return to old Gabe in this scenario where the God complex and the lack of humility, and you're right, it does not bode well. If you were like peak performance, you know, um, John Jones in the UFC for whatever period of time he was at the top like you can kind of run on that energy and talent and um, being better than everybody for a period of time, but nobody's better than everybody for all time. And Gabe's in a situation right now where there's a bunch of contenders who can do what he's doing, you know, like they're all kind of vying it out. If Gabe, you know, uh, has humility, he can, and everything's working for him. He can still win the world champ the world title and all that kind of thing. But there are other people now that are really, really, really close competing with him. Um, and so I don't think that he can survive on bravado alone at this point and ego alone. There does need to be more nuance to what's going on. And to be perfectly honest, just watching his surfing in that heat against Cole Hauschman, Cole looks new to me. Cole just has a different drive, a different spark. He's got more of an Aki kind of approach. And it looks better than Gabe does. And it could be a result of us just having seen Gabe for a decade now and Cole is new, but that's something that Gabriel's going to have to contend with, you know? And so he's not, he's not the solely dom dominant surfer anymore. 
Yeah. You know, like I said, it's going to be fun to see what, how it all plays out. Cole certainly has gained a whole new slew of fans, uh, counting you and I amongst them, although you might not be a new fan. I certainly am. I wasn't very uh, in tune with who Cole Hausman was as a surfer. I didn't really know, you know, how he surfed. I, I didn't realize how big and powerful he is. He's a big bloke. And um, that's kind of refreshing. And and I think a lot of people, a lot of, like, in fact, somebody, my friend Ben came up to me and said, how about Cole? You know, he was, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, Cole. Yeah. And he, and Ben specifically talked about how it's great for big guys again, mm -hmm. you know, like it's great to have a big guy, not a 145 pound guy, but to have a guy, a big guy went on tour and, um, and a guy who doesn't surf necessarily big, I'm not saying he's not powerful, but he doesn't have that gangly like Frederico or, um, you know, one of the ginger Australians, you know, bead or whatever, he's, he's kind of got more of a, kind of a tight San Clemente compact, you know? Yeah, I agree. He, so interestingly, I first met Cole when he was probably eight years old. Like I used to film with Quicksilver way back in the day when Kanoa was like that age too. And so I would, I remember specifically one session, like uh, I, there's probably a video online with it. I could probably dig it up, but it was like, like Kanoa, Leonardo Fioravanti because he was on Quicksilver at the time. And then Cole was on uh, Volcom at the time, but he was just, he would hang out with the other local Groms. And so I was there to film Leo and um, Kanoa, Northside Huntington Pier. And I remember filming with Cole. That was my first exposure to him. So I've always tracked his career and I'd see him around, you know, Southern California and stuff. But he was such a tiny kid then and was not the standout compared to Kanoa. But I, tracked him and then he really sprouted in his late teens into like not only a tall kid but like thick muscly kind of kid and his surfing really i think at that point shifted because to me he was just one of um i don't know one of many southern california ripper kids but when he developed that extra weight and heft i think he kind of set himself apart because he was able to utilize it and his surfing took on a new dimension um but since I mentioned sponsors, it should be noted he's on Visla now. This has got to be Visla's first CT win for a male surfer. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, he, uh, they've never, I think previously, they've never, they, yeah, they've never really sort of reached out or had that sort of CT vibe. Visla, they've always been more like creative, you exactly. know, artists and creators and, you know, groovy, groovy guy. But, um, they kind of got groovy guy and a CT competitor all in one. <laughs> they do. He's a great fit for the team and their ethos and all that sort of stuff. So, but it's, it's also great to see, like, I remember two nights ago when I was watching this event and he won and seeing that sticker, you know, being, while he's being chaired up the beach, I was like, this is a kind of a big moment for Visla. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a really good... interesting point that kind of probably bypassed, at least for me, I didn't think of it like that, but you're absolutely right. So good for them. Yeah, great Good for, for Vinny and I think Vinny's still there and Eric and of course Paul. Yeah, so that's cool that and I tell you he's he's a very interesting guy, right? I my th I think when you reach this level and you and I have spoken about this before, look, there's a lot of really good surfers, but when you get to this level and you're paddling out as a rookie against Gabe Medina, lesser mental people competitors would crumble. Yep, he's just like let's go, you know, which seems to. There, there seems to be something in the water in San Clemente where those kids, they're not kids, they're adult males now, but in the end, women, they are like, I, no big deal. You know, and maybe Kolohe is a part of it. May, maybe uh, Matt, maybe the guys that lost are a part of it. But for whatever reason, there's no um, mental drop off. There's no yeah. like, oh, my God, I'm surfing against my idol. It's more like, mm -hmm. watch me kick this guy's ass. Yeah. And that was that's the difference between. You know, at this level and really in any competitive sport, I think they're all good, mm -hmm. but who can rise mentally to the challenge? And Cole and, certainly did that. And Cole even stated that Gabriel Medina was his favorite surfer growing up. Like that is his idol. And you're right. He did not show any uh, misstep competing against his idol. I mean, proof um, of that is after you beat Gabe Medina there's definitely opportunity for a letdown. You're like, dude, I just beat Gabe Medina. He's the guy. He was my guy. You know, mm -hmm. and you could see like a heat letdown coming, but it was just full on pedal to the metal. My foot's on the gas and I'm going to choke everyone out. 
So interestingly, he beat Gabriel Medina in the round of 32, Kanoa Igarashi in the next round, Ethan Ewing in the next round, Matt McGillivray, and then Griffin Colapinto in the final. So that is a murderer's row. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. no joke. He had to fight. He had to take down the best of the best. He did. And, so um, yeah. Factormeals.com slash surf 50. Let me tell you, Factor Meals has filled a specific gap in our lives that has simplified our busy schedules and satisfied and nourished us. If you follow me on social media, you know that I love to cook. My wife and I love food and wine, but there are still at least five meals a week where we're just underprepared, short on time, and don't want to make a bad dietary decision, nor sacrifice the pleasure that we get out of dining. Factor has solved it. Chef prepared meals that are delivered to your house weekly. They take two minutes to heat up and they're designed to be eaten anywhere. There's no prep, no cooking, and you can recycle the package that it comes in. Delicious meals that are good for you with over 35 options to choose from each week. Go to factormeals.com slash surf50. Less expensive than dining out, more delicious, more nutritious. Factormeals.com slash surf50. One other in stark, stark contrast to Gabriel Medina's post-heat interview, we should note uh, and commend Griffin Colapinto for his display of um dignity and class actness in the final he lost to his younger sparring partner in the final and helped chair him up the beach and congratulated him in the win yeah that was cool and um and it's there's been some kind of rumblings online about you know the brazilian storm is over now we've got this sort of i don't know San Clemente squall. What do you want to call this? <laughs> <laughs> the San Clemente something or other. It, it, you know, I mean, Griffin's in first. We've got Jake Marshall in fourth. You know, um, Cole Crosby. So there's some Southern Californians here that are solid this year going into the final event before the cut. Uh, so being a Southern Californian, I should be raw raw ing right now. However, yeah. I will just present one counter argument. Okay. As I'm watching this event in the finals unfold, and it's, you know, three foot kind of crappy, what looks like uppers uh, surf, it's yeah. no surprise to me that the guys who surf trestles all the time uh, would be winning this event or doing well in this event. I couldn't help but have that as a caveat in my head, which was like, well, okay, it makes sense these guys rose to the top in this, and I don't want to take anything away from Cole. He earned it and took down the best of the best, but this is like watching a a local event, kind of. You yeah. know, like this isn't world class surf with the world. It is the world class surfers, but only surfing to the level that I would see them surf locally. Like I would like to see them, you know, in world class waves battling yeah. it out. And if if they were, would would Griff and Cole still be in the final? Was the only caveat question I had in my head. Well, I don't, I don't think that they couldn't make the final, but what the bigger picture here is that the WSL has begun and has normalized basically what we're seeing as NSSA events. Mm -hmm. And it's like the new, it's not the new normal. It's been going on for so long that we stopped talking about it. And frankly, the waves sucked, you know, obviously the first couple of rounds, there were some fun waves and that's what you want, but um, it's, you know, I mentioned this in one of my comments on Instagram that these types of situations don't occur in waves of consequence. Like exactly judging incongruities, waves of consequence, even the field, it evens it all out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, arguing over is a two foot wave, not a three foot wave. So I let it go under priority that dude, it's two to three feet. Like the waves suck. And you can't have the world's best surfers putting on surfing that's worthy of the world's best surfers in waves that are not worthy of the best surfers. And, uh, you know, I, I got caught up in some, you somehow my algorithm on YouTube led me to the 1981 Bell's beach event in 15 foot surf. It was one of these things where it's like newly remastered, newly restored, never before seen footage from the the huge 1981 bells event when it was 15 feet, Simon, um, 
was surfing his three fin and it was awesome. And I mean, it, it had beach commentary. There was like a local Australian guy on the PA system. It might've been claw or somebody. It was one of these sort of rich Aussie talkers. And he was on the PA system talking to the entire beach over the footage that you watched, you know, and he'd be like, and Derek Hines up and riding, look at him go, blah, blah, blah. you know, and he would just call out each and every ride. And in the background, there's like the Rolling Stones are playing in the background in the <laughs> little river band, you know, and like Kenny Loggins, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? like all these 1981 songs are playing, you know, and it, it was because it was 15 feet. It was engaging as heck. The surfing was these guys were on single fins, you know, yeah. and and the, but the waves were just momentous. And so it was just, like I say, engaging. I mean, there was rides where the, the whole thing would close out all the way to Winky Pop. And at the bottom of the wave, the guys weren't jumping off. They were getting down onto their bellies and riding in for a little bit before they could jump off and then have to deal with the paddle back out, you know, and, um, you know, Terry cool. Richardson, Mark Richards, Bobby Owen, Simon Anderson, um, who's the super powerful regular foot Aussie guy that that had the radical roundhouse um, that rode for Quicksilver? Uh, oh, anyway, his name oh, was... El Kong. No, but there was probably some Kong in there too. Um, anyway, it was just it was awesome. So if you happen to get that thing popping up in your YouTube algorithm, well, check it out, and it just proves that the waves are the stars. The waves are the stars you can't do it without the waves. And I guess the, my experience was I'm not even watching this event. The only reason I engaged with the event was because Gabriel Medina spouted out off and I had to go. So because they're not allowing the most kind of essential part of the sport to be the focal point of their organization and their tour, it gets dumbed down to the lowest common denominator, which is people talking crap on the internet. You know, like that's now what the storyline is of this Bells event. It's what you led this story, our podcast with, you know, it's the only reason why I engaged with the event. I had a number of messages from people. One was, I love professional surfing more than anybody else. And I've completely lost interest in this year's tour. Another one, I'll, I actually- Well, hold on, let me, let me push back a little bit because Pipeline was great. Sunset Beach was great. Like those two events were good. And we, we both acknowledged that like mm -hmm. the, the, the season was fun. Like yeah. I was engaged in that. Yeah. And now we stepped back because well, two, of why two too events. many guys on on tour, make it so that you can't run an event in two days. You need two days to run an event. If you yeah. don't realize that by now, you've lost the plot. So a buddy, Sean said, if you can't run an event at snapper in perfect conditions with the country that values surfing as its national pastime, then you are a poorly managed organization. And he used Snapper as an example because it's exciting. You know, like you should be running at Snapper, not at Bells. And if you can't, if you're, if the WSL's argument is still to this day, oh, it's a permitting issue and you got to blah, 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 blah. Australia's national pastime is surfing. You should be able to sit across if you are an organization worth your salt that are the arbiters of surfing. You should be able to sit across a table from whoever it is in Australia and be like, hey, you know, good surf matters. Let's put these guys at Snapper and these girls at Snapper when it's pumping. If you are an organization who cannot make that the end result of what the viewer is watching, you're not great at your job, full stop. Yeah, there's, there's two events in Australia. And here's the thing, in many ways, and I'm going to probably catch a little bit of grief here, but um, Australians in some ways have kind of painted themselves into a corner with bells because there's so much history, so much legacy, so much lore. It's the longest running professional surf contest, I think, according to historians. I'm not positive. And, and, it, and Australians love bells and they love the idea of holding the bell and ringing the bell and and I get it. Bells is a beautiful place and it is historical and it does have tons of history and lore. But my sense is that it's not a world-class wave. It's, it's a great wave. And on its day, it can be a world-class wave. And oh, by the way, if we run an event in two days, we might be able to capture it luck, you know, in one of these years with 
where we ground a champion in epic bells. But there's definitely, if you're only having two events in your continent, there's definitely two other spots that would be way better totally. from a bunch of different aspects, from viewing, from wave quality, from everything than, than bells. But I mean, we're talking, we're in the center of surf history. We're in Torquay. We're in, we're in rip curl quicksilver land. We're in, we're, you know, we've got so much. It's hard for Australians to back out of that and go, you know what? Maybe they're right. It's just, it's too ingrained in their culture. It would be like saying, Hey, we can't have the masters at Augusta anymore because the, the golf course, it, it just isn't as good as it used to be. And there'd just be, we've got a hundred years of Augusta history. We can't not have the mask. No, that's a bad example because it's, actually Augusta's, the golf course is incredible. Yeah. But you get what I'm saying. Augusta and the masters has the same level as bells as far as, you know, the geography. Yeah. The, the legacy metaphor is relatable there, but yeah. surfing is unique because the medium or the, um, equipment has changed so much. So I think that Bells was a very relevant location to have on tour for high performance surfing through the eighties, uh, through the seventies, through the eighties. But ever since the nineties, it's just not a high performance. It doesn't suit high performance surfing. And if that is the goal of what the tour is doing, it is not the best venue to showcase that goal. You know, yeah. it's just, it's surfing has moved on from Bells. I'm sure it's still a blast to surf. It's super fun. But as a viewer, trying to put the best surfers in the best waves, this is not one of the best waves. So the legacy can still be honored by doing specialty events. Like I would love to see an event at Bells every single year, but it doesn't need to be on the championship tour trying to crown the most, you know, high performance well, I, I pushing think it the could edge. Be on, I think it could be on the CT, but it has to be two, a two-day event and the window has to be at least two weeks even if we did the two-day event thing and shorten the number of surfers on tour there's waves in australia that would be better suited to figuring Maybe. out our end goal. i think if it's eight feet i think if it's six to eight feet with 10 foot sets i think we'd enjoy watching it well we would enjoy it. like i think we'd be like you know what this is high quality surf they're like you know yeah but if you open up all of australia there's and it's six to 10 feet. I'd rather do Naralu. I'd rather do Snapper. I'd rather do Kira. I'd rather, you know, there's a ton of other waves. Well, so I got one final email that I'll read about what we're talking about and we can move on to Kelly if you want. But Adam in Australia said, quote, two to three foot short period when affected, or as the WSL calls it, contestable. 20 to 25 foot Fiji without a drop of water out of place, or as the Wazel calls it, a lay day inconsistent <laughs> as hell bells on Easter Sunday, or as the Waz says, send them out. There's a crowd who cares if there's only one decent set wave. There's only a cut coming up. I didn't make a mistake, says Gabby, judging as a joke, or as the Waz calls it, not a peep. Wave that only breaks an hour either side of low tide. Perfect site for a contest. The surfers are doing amazing things, but heck, this is a hard sport to follow. Yeah, I think he kind of nailed it right there. That's it's going to be hard to. Well, good for him. Who was that that sent that in? Adam. Adam, you nailed it, mate. Fat income. <laughs> uh, let's take a break and we'll talk about some more stuff in the surf world. All right, be right back. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform that is designed for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to subscriptions. They have flexible templates with designs for every category, templates that are simple to drag and drop your artwork or logos into, but flexible enough to redesign to your specs. They have online store templates that make it easy to sell physical merchandise, digital or service products like podcast subscriptions and paywalled content. They even make customizable merch. You can design products and they will handle the production, inventory, and the shipping and handling. So let Squarespace handle it for you. They'll save you time. They'll save you money. And we'll save you money by going to squarespace.com surf. You get a free trial and you get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace.com surf. Enjoy. 
Yeah, let's talk. Welcome back. We're back. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so the Kelly Slater news is that he's put his home in Hawaii at Lania Kea, just, you know, towards the Haleiwa side of Lania Kea up for sale. I didn't know that. Yeah, I found this on Beach Grit, believe it or not. Derek loves a real estate story. I guess he does. And, um, you know, it's not really news, but Kelly Slater's selling one of his places in Hawaii. So that's the, oh. that's the news. Maybe we move on. I feel like it's a little uh, TMZ-ish. Well, Kelly, I mean, is it um, the, the story here would be, is this related to the birth of Kelani? Kelani is the joint name between the two of them. Is this related to a shift in his life, you know, a trajectory? And then also the kind of side story here is coming off of Bells, he got his third 17th of the season. So there's been four events. He has three 17ths. Those are his best three scores because the other event he withdrew from Portugal. So definitely all things worth noting as it relates to uh, the greatest surfer of all time. Yeah, I mean... I guess he's not going to make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even close, but he's got, he's got wild card. Like they'll give him wild cards throughout the yeah. rest of his life. So we'll see him yeah. surfing again. Um, as we should discuss the cut though, because Gabriel Medina isn't doing much better. He also has three 17th. He has a third place from Portugal. So that buoys him a little bit, but he's in 20th position and 22 is the cutoff. So he's only two spots ahead of the mid year cut. That's what I'm saying. Like with his headspace where it's at and he goes to Margaret's, can you give me some insight into his past history at Margaret's uh, performance wise? I don't have it on. Yeah. I know. I don't either, me. which says a lot, right? Like you and I can, we can easily go, Oh, we know this guy does really well at Margaret's. There's a couple of guys that you, you know, like Jordy and obviously Jack and John, John, of course, you know, like there's some guys that are at the top that you can go. Yeah. Gabe's at the top in our mind competitively but he's never one that you go oh yeah i remember him doing really well at margaret river no i really don't um so below that cut line though yes cade Mad cade madsen seth moniz kind of surprising to see seth there sammy pupo miguel pupo jacob wilcox frederico Moraes, kaiwa belly Caleb robson eli hanneman david silva kelly slater in 30 Third, literally the last position right before the two surfers who haven't surfed an event this year, which are Joao Chianca and Felipe Toledo. Yeah, I saw um, one of the guys, it might have been Holden Trenka. One of the guys at Stab said that 9,300 is kind of more or less the magic number in the past. Like if you have 9,300 total points, you're going to make the cut. And, um, you know, there's, I, I look at Kyle and I'm like, Kyle's like, you could see Kyle making the cut. Like Kyle does actually well at Margaret River. And I don't know. I, when I look at this list, I go, that's the one guy that like, if you were to throw some underdog money on somebody making the cut, I think it's Kyle. Yeah. He's done well at Margaret's in the past. Um, yeah. So we didn't even mention, but Caitlin Simmers won on the women's side over Joanne DeFay at Bells. Oh, and yeah. Kait Caitlin's just living up to all of our expectations. We love her so much. Her surfing is radical, her personality, all of it. She's won two events this year, obviously the pipe event. And then this one, um, Joanne DeFay won the last event in Portugal. So she's in second place. And then Molly Picklum, who won the sunset event, is sitting in third under the cut line. Lakey Peterson, Sawyer Lindblad, which is a bummer to see because we had high expectations for her. Um, Isabella Nichols, Sally Fitzgibbons, Alessa Spencer, India Robson, Robinson, and Sophia McCullough, all below the cut on the women's side. Yeah, you know, this thing's got me thinking. The waves are the stars because when, we know when we were talking about the women a lot in Hawaii, mm -hmm. when the waves are big, Good point. And I haven't, I don't really, I wasn't too excited about women in Portugal. I don't even know who won. I don't, not sure I care. So and Joanne DeFay. I don't, you know, so it's yeah. making me think, 
am I just misogynistic, which there could be a little bit of that. If so, I apologize. I'm trying to be a better man, but maybe I'm not. Or is it that the waves just are boring? <laughs> and so it doesn't really matter, men or women, we're bored. If the yeah. waves are boring. No, you got a great point. Uh, their surfing was a lot more exciting in waves of consequence. So Margaret River starts on the 11th. Look forward to that about a week away. We will be in El Salvador when that event begins. Um, I've got an email from Tony Roberts here, if you're interested. Yes, TR. It's I love that guy. Talk about, that guy is inspiring me. He's he's on the AARP surf team for sure. And he surfs like he's 45. Well, Derek on Beach Grid also wrote an article featuring one of we were talking about Tony Roberts' uh, YouTube channel a few weeks back. He's just dropping knowledge on there, historical tidbits. Um, and one of the videos was focusing on Tony surfing. He's living in the Dominican Republic right now. And the article that Derek wrote was, is this the best 60-year-old surfer on the planet? Wow, that's pretty good. Paul. I mean, I think of Michael Ho. I'm sure there are some, but it doesn't matter. I think at 60, if you're surfing, you're and surfing at the level that Tony's surfing at, you're, you win. You know what yeah. I mean? You're, yeah. you're, you're winning life. You know what I mean? Like good for him. And I don't, now that I'm saying it, I don't even think Tony's 60. Maybe the article was about, you know, aiming to peak at 60, like still improving through your mid fifties kind of a thing. Right. Anyways, right. Tony, Tony uh, messaged, emailed in reference to Dale's article last week or Dale's email last week, Dale, a listener wrote in about is foam really your friend? And so TR wanted to kind of add to that conversation. He said, TR and the DR here, loving the show. Thanks for what you guys do. You guys are so on point in your reply to Dale. For 80% of days, almost anywhere, a normal shortboard is not the right tool for the job, especially for older surfers. Where I surf daily, an incredibly fun yet somewhat soft reeling point setup, reef point setup. Um, all the guys my age all started in the 80s and are orthodox shortboard only dudes. I remember the 80s and longboarders were the enemy. Some never <laughs> emerged from that mindset. 95% of the surfers here of all ages cannot do a wave justice on a normal shortboard unless it's a rare time, all time day. On the daily, they can barely catch waves. And when they do, they're trying to play catch up, especially the older dudes. Their frustration is difficult to hear and watching and watch on this dreamy Caribbean turquoise colored aquatic playland. If they were riding fish or mid lengths or logs, they would be having so much more fun exploring other aspects of the surfing discipline um, that by the way, greatly help one's shortboarding and might even smile on occasion. This is kind of the most important contribution I think to this conversation. He says, there is one exception. He's a 50 plus year old uh, surfer shaper named Bando. He specializes in boards for this spot that are super short or mid lengths, all very thick and feature pinched tapered rails. He claims he does not want to ride a long board. And so he makes boards for him that are alternative. He catches a ton of waves, surfs them well and explains and proves that thickness does not affect a board's sensitivity if the rails compensate. I have ridden a bunch of his boards and would not, you would not believe how epic they are. There is, uh, well, he says, there's nothing more pathetic than an orthodox shortboard old guy, which I could have left that out. But I think the detail here is design. Oh, understanding of design opens up a bunch of, um, it opens your mind to a bunch of other options. So it's not just pointy thruster, high performance shortboard. You could still ride a short board that is sensitive and allows you to surf to a high performance level, but hides the foam. Foam can, can be your friend if the rails are still pinched and there's other design elements that allow you to still rip. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's, let's foil out the, the rails, you know, thin them out. We want to keep that rail buried throughout the turn. And um, if you have too much foam out on the rail, you're just not going to be able to continue to keep that that rail buried, especially as we get older, we lose a little bit of strength. So I'm all about um, plenty of foam in the chest area, right at the stringer. And then let's foil it out nice and thin, get it nice and blady where I'm going to be sinking it. And yeah. uh, good, good point by Tony. And maybe that's what Dale's writing, by the way, like Dale um, 
he said short board, but that doesn't specify, you know, the other dimensions of the board itself. So he could be riding something that is more volumed and pinched rails, um, which brings me to my next point. Uh oh, thing. look at this. What the? Oh, that's the Bobby Quad, huh? That is the Bob O Quad, Bobby Quad from Channel how, Islands. That how big did you get? Five eight. Oh man. So so thirty three point eight liters. Not that that matters, or that you and I track that, but it's five eight by twenty and an eighth by two and five eighths. Wow. That's it's right like it was in designed, your wheelhouse, bro. <laughs> like it was designed for you specifically. Oh, no, no, no. I think it's designed for our crew. We got 18 surfers that want to ride that thing. So we owe a huge thank you to Channel Islands for contributing this board as a community board to our El Salvador trip. And um, NVS Fins actually sent me a number of quad sets that they want us to kind of sample with this board in varying uh, variety, varying... Uh, setups and yeah. then leave the fins behind for the crew at Punta Mango to keep NVS fins on hand for them and their clients too. Yeah, and then yeah. trees wax sent us a box of base coat, which doubles as warm water wax. Yeah. We're going to need that for sure. Well, so, good. And by the way, another shout out channel islands uh, is not paying us, but the new travel board bags are insane. I picked one of those up with my Bobby quad and I don't even know if they're available on their website yet, but I've seen imagery of them prior to me yeah. picking this one up. Yeah. It's the best board bag I've ever owned by a long margin. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm actually getting mine today. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you to Scott and Devin and all the folks at Channel Islands for setting me up and you with the new board bag. That's super cool of them. And I'm psyched about that. Um, I'm confused. I'm, I'm, I'm having a surfboard dilemma. Oh, let's do it. Yeah. So I've got a couple of boards to choose from. One is this new 510 Twinser that Ryan Sakel made me, which I want to take, but I haven't ridden it. I've ridden it once and I don't, I haven't, I don't know. I, I haven't given it, it hasn't, the waves have been crappy. I haven't had a chance to to try it out. And then I've got a new 6'6 six, six Twinser from Stu Kenson which I haven't picked up yet, but I've seen it online. It looks cool. And because of the Bobby quad, I'm like, I'm confused because one thing, the Bobby quad could be so insane that there's a fight over it. <laughs> Nobody wants, everybody wants to ride the Bobby quad, <laughs> which I sense is going to be the case. I sense that that board's going to be really good. And, and then what Tony said, like, I'm kind of like, by the way, I'm going to be take. I I need to take the six six to Indo. I need to figure out the six six too. And what better place to figure it out than El Salvador? I'd like to take the six six just to get it through its get it understand it. You know what I mean? So I'm. You're, this you're is crazy. where my dilemma is. I'm, I've got plenty of stuff to chew on. You got. You're crazy for not just bringing both boards. Well, that. Yeah, I, I'm only bringing one board. <laughs> Yeah, that's the crazy part to me. Why wouldn't you just bring two? I mean, the, the extra lugging is minor compared to just having two available. You're surfing for an entire week and the conditions are going to change. It's going to be three foot. Some days are going to surf Las Flores where it's more rippable to bring the 510. And then Mango is going to be five to seven feet barreling. Bring the six. Uh, all right. Maybe I bring both. Why wouldn't you? Because I hate traveling with surfboards. But you're I'm, already traveling with a surfboard. A second surfboard is a 30% increase in effort. It's not a double increase in effort. It's not two bags, you know? Yeah, but what will my... I'll have to tip my porter more. <laughs> no, I hear you. Uh, maybe I'll think about that. Maybe I'll think you, that. you are a riddle wrapped in a conundrum, wrapped in a, <laughs> wrapped in a poem. Yeah. I can't right. figure it out sometimes. I can't either. Super obsessed with boards have external storage space for surfboards, but then only wants to travel with one board. <laughs> I guess I'm a sloth, but see, there's going to be some a ways. five, eight shortboard there. Yeah. Yeah. That takes the five, the shortboard equation out. And anyway, it's true. I mean, you make, that is a good point. So if that is the rationale then, and you are insistent on traveling with one board, then you bring the Kenson 
and rely on the Bobby quad for when you want to ride something smaller. That's not fair to Ryan, who I asked Ryan to get this board out in time for my trip to El Salvador, and I just haven't had a chance to try it. Yeah. I guess I could surf tomorrow. No, because the weather's shitty here. Yep. We haven't had good waves, and it's been yep. cold, man. Yep. So cold. Oh, well. Look. Uh -huh. um, Rocketmoney.com slash surf. Just this week, my wife figured out she was paying a subscription for Showtime, but then also paying for Paramount Plus, which includes Showtime for free. That's precisely what Rocket Money was designed for a modern tool that meticulously tracks the details that we easily get distracted from. It's a finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your monthly spending, and helps you lower your bills. It gives you freedom by helping you see your subscriptions in a simple dashboard and alerts you about hidden fees or increases. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash surf. Calm the clutter in your head, simplify the tedium of your financial life, and find freedom through rocketmoney.com slash surf. I want to mention this. The California Gold Surf Auction, the auction catalog is live and available for preview. You can go to auctions.thevintagesurfauctions.com or simply Google California Gold Surf Auction. We've got lots by surfboard craftsmen such as Dick Brewer, Dennis Pang, Pat Kern, Skip Fry, Steve Liss, Barry Kaniapuni. Tom Moray, Ben Ipa, Mike Eaton, Jerry Lopez, Mickey Munoz, Terry Martin, Eric Arakawa, Al Merrick, Mike Hinson, many, many others. David, we have something for you. We have a lot that features Kelly Slater posters and banners that I think you might be interested in. I could see those plastered behind you. Take my Kelly, money. When he, Kelly, when he had hair, you know, um, you could have a whole back imagery wall there of signed autographed Kelly Slater posters. I would love that. Nothing more. I'm in. That's what I thought. I wanted cool. to bring that up, bring that up to speed with you. So check out the uh, California gold surf auction. Uh, the catalog is available. Um, I have a couple of musty moments. You only I get have, one. Well, I have two. <laughs> so one surfboard, but two musty moments. Like I said, <laughs> unpredictable at best. <laughs> Have you seen the We Are the World documentary? No. On Netflix. No. Oh, you got to see this. It's it's epic. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's about an hour and a half long. If you go into Netflix and just search We Are the World, the documentary, it's called something else. It's called something like The Night of Music or something. But anyway, it, you'll find it. Yeah. And it's worth it just for Bob Dylan alone. Just to see Bob Dylan standing on this stage with all these people and his, the look on his face is all time i've completely come full circle on bob dylan i'm such a huge fan of his and david i know you will love this it's got kenny loggins there, it's funny because they've got all of these incredible musicians and i think your your either your your the way you feel about them will either go up or down like kenny loggins went way down in my book really um you know um is he being a douche or what I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to let you watch it. Um, Bruce Springsteen went up. Lionel Richie went way up. Al Jarreau, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, so Waylon Jennings, there's this part. Like, you got to watch it. It's pretty fun. I enjoyed it. You know, I don't want to oversell it. I don't want to oversell it. But if you like music and you, I believe, see, that's the thing is that if I talked to my kids and said, we are the world, they wouldn't even know what I was talking about. You know, I yeah, think you're crazy. young enough to get it. Yeah. I mean, I heard that song over and over and that Dylan thing became a meme, you know, watching him disconnected from reality, like looking around, standing in the crowd, bobbing his head slightly. It's um, so good. But it's funny. I saw that advertised on Netflix and it did not entice me at all. So I'm now going to watch it because of your recommendation. Yeah. I don't want to oversell it, but I if you grew up in that time period, I think you, you'll enjoy it. Cool. Do they have 
are they interviewing the people now with yes. 20 years of hindsight? Okay. Yeah. Most, some of them, not all of them. <clears throat> they interview um, Bruce Springsteen now, which is great. Lionel Jane, uh, Ly <laughs> I want to say Lionel James, who's the running back for the Chargers. <laughs> Lionel Richie? Lionel Richie from the Commodores. They interview him. And by the way, that guy's amazing. I'm a big fan of his. Yeah, he's impressive. And um, who are some of the other modern day? Oh, I think Huey Lewis, who's great. By the way, Huey Lewis went way up in my book. Like I was just kind of on neither here nor there with Huey Lewis. Now I'm a big fan after watching this. So anyway, um, yeah, they do cool. they do interview modern contemporary. Yeah, cool. I'm in. <clears throat> my, my other must see moment presented, presented by, by Trees, trees Wax. Wax right? Yeah, presented by Trees Wax is Calypti. I finally watched Calypti on YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> and I watched it. And I went, David. David was right. This movie is fun. And I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I have questions. I have questions about the relationship. What what happened with the relationship? Between who? Between uh, Torin and I guess, is it Alicia? Ayana. Ayana. Uh, they have a kid together. Are they married? Living together um, in Australia, what oh, are yeah. they doing? No, I mean they're partnered, partnered for life. I don't know if they actually officially ever got married or not, but yeah, they're all in. I mean, he was just here. She's from Santa Barbara, and so he was just here last month, spending time with her family in Santa Barbara and their kid. But yeah, they're um, they are definitely equal. They're yoked and partners for life for sure. Well, she's and, pretty impressive. I gotta yeah. Say. Um, She's pretty independent, it seems. So good for her. She was raised on a sailboat, actually. I know in the movie they talk about she didn't have much sail. Neither of them had much sailing experience, and that is true. But she was raised on a sailboat for part of their life. Um, I interviewed Torin when Calypti was released, and a portion of our interview that didn't make the final cut, um, he talks about the boat that she was raised on um, was... I forget where it was um, being stored, but somebody really did not do their job taking care of the boat while they were storing it. And so it kind of got ruined by a bunch of weather. And Torin and Ayana are looking to kind of spend the next phase of their life renovating that boat and bringing it back up to its full potential and then potentially doing another big trip like the Calypti trip with that boat from her childhood. Oh, that'll be cool. That'll yeah. be amazing. That's going to take some money. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So those are my must-see moments. We are the world in Calypti. I've got a must-see moment presented by Treeswax, which is actually a much must-listen moment. Um, it's been out there for a month or two, but Jamie Brissick does a podcast series for the Surfer's Journal called Soundings. And this season, he interviewed Grubby or Gordon Grubby Clark. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know if we ever discussed it on the show or not. I've been meaning to kind of get to it for a while, but it's just an excellent interview. We haven't heard from Gordon Clark very often. I can think of one other, two other instances that I've heard from him publicly since he shuttered Clark Foam in 2006. But Jamie does a great job interviewing Gordon. And Gordon, you know, there was a lot of controversy about him closing Clark Foam, and they don't really get into the controversy at all. But Gordon does a phenomenal job providing a history lesson for how he came to be and his influences and the people around him at that time that simply nobody else would be a, a history lesson that nobody else would be able to provide. So I think it's very insightful and great listening. Yeah, I want to check that out for sure. Just based on the last bit that you mentioned, you know, um, super interesting guy and and uh, sort of you know, backbone under the radar, uh, incredible amount of, of importance to where we are in the surf industry, surfboard building industry. So I also have a must listen moment presented by trees wax. Let's hear it. I listen to the Lex Friedman podcast occasionally. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Jared Kushner, I think a couple months ago as a mm -hmm. good listen, which surprises me. Me too. But Mark Cuban, Mark Cuban was just on Lex Friedman. 
and I told my wife about it and I've sent it off to my kids too. It's a really great lesson regarding a lot of stuff, AI stuff, um, and the, pre the prescription drug situation. Um, and I found it fascinating and I'm a big Mark Cuban fan now after mm. a long form interview with him, which I had never heard before. Wow. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. Also an impressive human being. Um, by the way, I didn't mention it yet, but drinkag1.com slash surf is what I've been drinking throughout this. Look at the deep, deep green. That's how you know it's oh, yeah. good. I told you one, you and I agreed on this. Like, what do you do when you finish your AG1? Do you rinse it out or do you put a little bit more water in there and shake it around and drink the last little bits? And you and I, I do, I do that. that. Option, we do, option yeah. B. Option B. Yeah. You, you don't clean it. You take all the little residue that's still there and you do one final hit. I'll go one up on you. Yeah. When I pour the patch, the pouch of powder into the canister, it creates this unbelievable plume of green <laughs> micro dust that floats. There's no way to do it without this plume. I sniff the plume. <laughs> I thought you were going to gather the plume in your hands and put it in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to vacuum up as much plume as I can. You know, you don't want that going to waste. So, well, uh, the question remains, are we going to do a podcast when we're in El Salvador? We have to. Okay. So we'll you know do that. There listeners... might be a, there could be a gay poem by then. You know what the, I mean? We can freestyle it on air. We can workshop it on air for the people. But if we went and did this and listeners who weren't on the trip, they'd be like, we want content. You guys are together at last. How do you not produce a, a podcast for us? We owe it to the listeners. Yes. Agreed. All right. We'll do it. Okay. Bring a, do you still have that road mic I sent you? Bring that road mic down. What's that? Do you still have this microphone that I sent you a year ago? I do. Yeah. I do. Bring, bring it with you, please. Okay. Yeah, I will. Okay. Why wouldn't I have it? What do you think? I'd sell it or something? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I do. I, misplace it is probably where, where I would have bet my money on, but I asked you to bring it to North Carolina and you didn't. So I don't know. Oh, but bring, shoot. Sorry about bring that. Bring it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, look, uh, we've had a big show. We've talked about a lot. We've said a lot. A lot has been discussed. So until next time, adios and aloha.